Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. Um, if this is your first of our Emerge webinar series, welcome. And if you have attended more than one, welcome back. We are very excited to have you. Um, today's topic is going to be feeding therapy, um, the services that we offer at Emerge Pediatric Therapy, and they are going to be presented to you by Gwen Joyce, who's here with us now. Um, she is one of our therapists who uh, leads this program at Emerge, and I'm very excited to learn more, and I'm very excited for all of you to learn more. Um, so if you're listening live right now, welcome. And if you're listening on a replay, thank you so much for taking the time um, to learn with us today. So before we jump into it, I do want to give a shout out to our community partners who helped make not just today's webinar, but all of the webinars possible. Um, the first one is Goldfish Swim School. I am in our Carborough Clinic right now, and about 10 minutes away from me is Goldfish. Um, they are an indoor swim lesson facility, and much like we do here at Emerge, they are building confidence in kids through the safety of swim lessons. They are open all year round. They have a um, heated area. Uh, like when you're waiting and watching, it feels very tropical in there. Um, it's designed with big colors and, and bright murals, and it's just such a great place for kids. And we're so happy to be partnered up with them. So if that is something that your family would benefit from, please look into services from Goldfish Swim School. Um, a very timely one for today, actually, for feeding therapy is our partnership with Holman Family Dental Care. Um, Shana Holman is their um, like lead dentist and owner of the practice. Um, I have known her for quite some time. She has several kids that she's raising with her husband in this community. Um, and they're all just really uh, community-minded, um, supportive folks that we're lucky to have here as our neighbors. Um, they do a lot of work with tongue ties and torticollis and a lot of the things that there's actually an overlap with feeding therapy support, speech therapy, things like that. So we're great, very grateful that they jumped on board too. Um, Robbie Norris is a Farm Bureau insurance agent. He is also located about 10 minutes up the street from me. Um, and honestly, he's just been in this community for such a long time. When I told him about the idea for the webinars, he jumped on it so fast. Um, he wanted to do anything he could to support families learning and having more access to information that they might not have before and just any ways that he could support families and, and cheer them on and be kind of, you know, behind the scenes helping make this happen. So very grateful for him um, in our community and with these webinars. And then finally, we have Chapel Hill Media Group. They are 97.9 The Hill on FM radio and they are chapelboro.com online. Um, chapelboro.com is this area's only source for daily local news. So they're doing a great job covering the news happening right here at home and lifting up uh, voices right here to learn from the people who are living here and working here and thriving here. Um, again, a great community partner. When I told them we were doing this, they said, how can we help and how can we uh, literally broadcast these webinars out so that more families can learn about them um, and, and take part. So that's our um, sponsorship lineup. Great community partners. So grateful for them. Please, please seek out ways to engage with them. Um, however you so that is my spiel until we come back at the end and I will hand it over to the expert. So Gwen, take it away. Perfect. So my name is Gwen Joyce. I, a little bit about me, I graduated from Utica College in like central New York with my master's in OT in June of 2016. Um, after that, I began working in OT, private practice, and pediatrics. Um, I was in Charleston and then Greenville, South Carolina before coming to work with Emerge in 2022. I specialize in feeding from infancy through adolescence. Um, and some of my trainings, just some various like feeding trainings that I've I've done as as well as trainings in person with colleagues have been the SOS approach to feeding, Beckman oral motor, adapted baby led weaning, um, food scientists, which is um, related to the SOS just with older kids, uh, sensory motor approach to feeding, which combines oral motor and sensory feeding, as well as I've taken a few 
TOTS courses, so those tethered oral tissues, so plot the TOT, TOTS training, full body approach to TOTS, and I've also done some work in cranial sacral therapy and TMR level one. I am currently the feeding team lead, and I work mostly with development of the program and of our feeding therapists and feeding teams across all three of our clinic locations, so Carborough, Cary, and Durham. And then a fun fact about me is I have a dog named Winston, and he's named after my favorite character on New Game. So, um, and a little bit about Emerge. So Emerge was founded in 2001 by Bonnie Hacker. Um, we provide speech, PT, and occupational therapy, and then feeding therapy as well. Um, and we serve infants through adulthood here. We have currently full-time staff. We have two PTs, 23 OTs, and 15 speech therapists. Um, and then regarding feeding therapists in general, we have nine OTs that practice feeding therapy and seven SLPs that practice feeding therapy across all three of our clinic locations. And then some of our objectives are to identify red flags and common reasons for food refusals identify common reasons children won't eat, define feeding therapy, identify the overlap with sensory and oral motor skills, understanding oral motor development and its relation to food textures, um, identifying how to, ide how to engage your child during mealtimes, and then when to refer your child for feeding therapy and touch base with your pediatricians about those referrals. Okay, so here are some of our red flags. So red flags, simple. The food refusal is usually a sign if that is consistent or you're noticing um, refusal of certain types of foods. Sometimes these kids will avoid coming to the table because they're linking table time with this stressful food engagement. Some other things are gagging, choking on foods. Um, if they go to touch foods and immediately pull their hands back or want to wipe their hands immediately, that can be a sign of some, some difficulty with some of that sensory piece. We'll see kids throw food on the floor. That can be a developmental thing, um, as well as if they just don't want it on their plate, they'll frequently toss onto the floor or try to push their plates away, things like that. Um, An almost anxious response when you're presenting new foods or even foods that they've had before that may even just look a little bit different or have a different type of sauce. Um, and let's see, not eating across settings. So sometimes we'll see kids that eat really well or you're told they re eat really well at school or daycare, but at home you're not seeing that, that progress or at home they're eating okay. And then when you go to different things in the community, they can't process and they can't engage in that mealtime activity, um, as well as preference for textures of foods or certain brands of foods, um, taking bites that are too large or too small or taking excessive time at meal times is another one here. So here are some things that we frequently hear that parents have been told. So um, a big one is if they're hungry, they'll eat. And in my experience, that generally is not how it goes, but with some feeding therapy and some collaboration with, with parents and child, we can be successful with that. Um, they just need a reward to eat. Or if a, if a child doesn't ingest the food or eat it, that's wasteful. Um, food is for eating and not playing. And a food refusal is behavioral and spitting out food isn't an option. So some of those, okay. But here are some common reasons that kids won't eat. So it could be pain or discomfort. So this could re be related to GI discomfort or ENT. So GI could be due to reflux or um, delayed gastric emptying. There's tons of reasons, GI-wise constipation that a child might not want to eat. Um, ENT wise, there could be issues with like airway obstruction. So thinking about um, tonsils or adenoids um, and various other pieces there. Um, it could be um, immature motor or oral motor skills. So they just don't have the oral motor skills to manage the foods that are being presented. Um, or you're noticing them refuse certain textures because those ones are seemingly unsafe or giving their body information that they're not ready for. 
and that leads me into sensory processing. So sensory processing challenges um, can be related to like that interceptive ability. So not being able to identify when they're hungry, or it could be due to um, difficulty with tactile processing. So they don't like how that feels on their hands. They don't like how that feels in their mouth. Um, also could be related to that proprioceptive system. So that body awareness and understanding where things are in our mouth or we're seeing kids like pocketing food or holding food um, or forgetting that it's in their mouth, which can be related to oral motor as well. Be learned experience. If they've tried a food that was too challenging or uncomfortable and they learn that, oh, that one's not safe. I don't want to eat that one again. So it can be that learned experience as well, where we'll see kids like really stick to only their comfortable foods. Um, and then mealtime pressure as well. So pressure can look very different. So obviously we want your kids to eat. Um, and sometimes kids can even feel that pressure just by you looking at them. So sometimes just that direct watching can be a little bit stressful for them, which makes it hard to eat because they have that like anxious response, that heightened level of arousal from that. It can also look like presenting things or being like, oh, just, just take a bite. Cause obviously we want them to take a bite, but if they're not feeling ready for that quite yet, that pressure can do the negative um, result. So th the opposite of them not eating at all. Okay, so what is feeding therapy? So feeding therapy at Emerge, we use um, principles of sensory processing to support the nervous system while expanding diet. So we kind of look into those sensory systems and get an idea of how they're processing that information and work on full body regulation to help with regulation during mealtimes because that tends to be a little bit tricky for these kids. Um, we assist clients and caregivers in expanding their diets in a supportive way. So thinking about um, the family and their dynamics and how we can help move forward with them and their specific needs. Um, we also use modeling and coaching techniques to help clients uh, explore familiar and unfamiliar foods using a just right challenge. So if a kid, if I present like broccoli and the kid has never touched broccoli, they don't even want to look at broccoli. Um, a just right challenge might be just, just visually engaging, which we'll get to. Um, and then utilizing oral motor and sensory motor strategies to assist in skill development so that they are feeling prepared to eat more complex foods. So some of the sensory signs um, that maybe your child is having a little bit of difficulty with certain sensory systems related to foods um, would be turning your bot their bodies away from the food. Um, you might see them lean back. That's one that we frequently see when we're presenting things if they're not quite ready for those. Um, so just trying to create space with between themselves and that food. Um, we'll also see them get up and run away from the table or be like, oh, I'm not hungry anymore when you're presenting some of these. Um, they may avoid looking at the foods. Sometimes we'll see kids that, that pretend like that food doesn't exist on the plate um, or some of those that are starting to like visually check in. So they'll look at it and then they'll look away. Um, we'll also see gagging at smells or taste or grimacing at smells. So they're smelling something, giving like a big facial expression um, for kids that like to tell us how they feel about those. We'll hear like, yuck, oh, that's gross and things like that. Um, another one, touching foods, pulling their hands away, immediately wanting to wipe their hands, crying at the table or difficulty transitioning to the table is another um, sign as well. Okay. So eating is more than just chewing and swallowing. So there are more than just those two steps. There's actually 32 steps to eating. Um, and the responses to these steps can let us know where they are currently with that food. So um, with some of our kids, we'll see that it can take upwards of 20 to 40 trials of food to learn enough to know if they like it or not. Um, so every time that we're engaging with a food, we're learning a little bit more about it. So there are several different ways to learn about foods. Um, and these are some of those steps. So there's all of these different stages. So we start kind of at the bottom with the tolerating the food. So that's um, looking at the food when it's in their space and then moving up to interacting with. So that's when we're starting to use utensils to move things around or using another food to kind of scoop them around, getting a little bit closer to it. And then there's smelling of food. So we're 
actively like working here and then slowly getting a little bit closer within their comfort level. So smelling. So it starts with just the odor in the room. So that could be maybe you're microwaving something and you put a lid on it, you bring it into your space, you're looking at it in the container, and then you're going to like lift the lid off, or you can poke little holes in the lid and getting little smells from that, and then increasing that within their comfort range. Um, and then you move up to touching. So that could be touching with one finger or the whole hand. So there's multiple steps in each of these categories, working up to taste. So starting with just putting it on their lip, licking their lip, to moving up to licking and um, biting off a piece, but then spitting it out. And that's where that spitting comes in. Um, sometimes if they know that it's an option to taste and spit out, if they're not feeling ready to swallow it, you'll see more of those engagements as well. And then all the way up to eating. So obviously that is the goal. Um, usually what we'll do is we will present to food. We'll see where the child is in these steps. And then maybe we would demonstrate a play-based uh, strategy, like a step above. So let's say um, your child is looking directly at the food. So we're like, okay, that's in the tolerate stage. Let's jump up to interacts with. So maybe we're going to take a utensil or a toothpick to kind of move it around or turn it into a train that we can push. And so there's various ways to kind of work through that. Okay. So why is oral motor important? So oral motor skills help us to chew food, bite pieces off of our food to make the just right bite size. Um, they help us drink through a straw or from, from a cup, um, managing different food textures, making sounds with our mouth, talking, um, and then keeping food together, creating that bolus for us to swallow. Um, so Commonly, we'll see kids that are doing really great with one texture, but they're presented with a more complex texture, um, or they're transitioning from purees to more solid foods, and they're having a really hard time with that piece. A lot of times, it's due to that um, decreased oral motor skill development. Um, and if we don't have these oral motor skills in place, it can make it really hard to manage that food, and we'll see those food refusals from that learned experience. And we could see gagging or choking in those scenarios as well. And so here are some of the oral motor skill development pieces. So um, we start at the top with number one, so breast and bottle feeding. So that's an in infancy. Um, that begins with a reflexive suck and, su and swallow, um, and that integrates usually between like three to four months. So at that time, sometimes we'll see more challenges um, depending on if they're learning that skill or if it, they're just using that reflex. Um, and then we go to that thin consistency pureed foods and cereals. So that's about four to six months. Um, and that's when you're transitioning to those solids. And that's when you're getting that uh, voluntary forward and backward suckling. So that tongue movement um, back and forth. And then you go up to those thicker consistency pureed foods. So that six to seven month range. Um, and that's when we get the lip closure to clear the bowl of the spoon um, and then suction and backward tongue movements to help move things back towards first swallow. And then we have the soft mashed table food. So in that seven to eight month range, um, so that's when we're starting to get some of that um, tongue wave movement. Um, and then we're getting the, the hard munchables, which are helping with our full tongue lateralizing to the side. Um, and that's when then that seven to eight month range, um, meltable hard solids. So that's that um, yeah, eight to nine month range here. So that's that tongue tip lateralization. That's when we're getting like more stick shaped things, which I'll go into that help us to move our tongue over to the side. Um, and then we have, yeah, the soft cubes, nine to 10 months. So um, that's that munching. So we're getting some of that up and down jaw movement, not quite rotary. Um, the soft mechanical, so those are single, single texture foods. So 10 to 11 months. Um, and that's when we start to see that rotary chew emerge. And then that soft mechanical table foods, 11 to 15 months. Um, and that's when we start to see more consolidation and more improved motor skills with those above examples. Um, and then we get some of that chewing refinement at 18 to 24 months, which help us get increased speed, uh, strength, efficiency, coordination, and all of that. 
So then we have some of our examples of all of those food textures that relate to those oral motor skills. So hard munchables, the goal of this one is for oral exploration, not consumption. So those are <clears throat> really hard foods. So like um, celery sticks, hard dry fruits, um, we can do like frozen melons or frozen um, bell peppers um, cut into sticks. Uh, sometimes we'll do, depending on the age of the kid, we'll do stale Twizzlers because that allows them to kind of munch on the side and get some of that um, exploration more laterally and move that tongue over to the side to start practicing some of that um, tongue lateralization. Um, and then we have me meltable hard solids. So those are foods that dissolve with saliva only, maybe minimal pressure from the gums and teeth. Um, so those are baby cereal puffs, yogurt melts, pirate booty, baby cookies, things that if you bite into them, they kind of stick together too. So we're not really working on um, scattering foods in the mouth. Um, and then there's the soft cubes. So that's the goal of those is they turn into a puree with that up and down pressure. So those are like avocado, uh, overcooked squash, banana, mandarin, oranges, things along those lines. Um, and then we have the soft mechanical single texture foods. So those are foods that break apart in the mouth easily. So those are like plain muffins. We use a lot of those little bites because if you bite into them, they kind of are easy to break down. Soft, small pastas, cubed bologna, scrambled eggs, things along those lines. Um, and then we have the soft mechanical mixed texture. So the goal is the same with the single texture. Um, just these have are a little bit more complex because it is more than just that one texture. So macaroni and cheese, soft chicken nuggets, crispy French fries, pizza, grilled cheese, things like that. Um, hard mechanical. So those are foods that will shatter in the mouth and don't rapidly melt. So those can be really crunchy crackers, kettle chips, hard cookies, hard raw fruits with peel. So thinking about apple with a peel um, and hard raw vegetables as well. Um, so what can happen? Children can refuse foods if their oral motor skills are not developed. So they're not feeling prepared and able to manage some of those increased um, textured foods. Um, they don't always tell you why they don't like foods, but generally we'll, we'll see signs either sensory wise or verbally. Well, they'll say, yep, or that's gross or other negative phrases around some of those things. Um, so my, my favorite way to reframe the yuck is to try to give, get more detail. So um, if a kid goes to smell a food and they're like, oh, yuck, that smells bad or gross, I'll say, oh, that has a big smell. Um, and then we can kind of work from there. So these are just some examples. They might taste it and then they're, they say that. So it has a big taste or a big look or they touch it and they're like, whoa, that's crazy. And so you say that has a big feel, doesn't it? So um, these are just some examples. So that looks wet, sticky, brown, big, small, crunchy, et cetera. There's various ways that you can help kind of describe some of those things. Um, and then breaking into like flavors that taste sweet or sour or salty, um, or that looks like, let's say they really like Ritz crackers and you give something else, but it's round and kind of crunchy. So it looks like this familiar food, you can say. Um, and then you can compare things shape or their color with other um, familiar things as well. Um, so what to do when your child does say yuck or you're seeing some of those sensory signs. So you can see where they are on the steps to eating. Um, and usually we'll see that and then will engage in that step. So trying to show playful engagement in that step and then work a step or two above and see how they respond to that. If you're going too high up on there, you'll see those sensory signs again where they're like, holy moly, that's crazy. Or they're pushing themselves back or removing themselves from what you're doing. And that's just a sign that we're working too high for their, their body at that point. Um, so for example, do they show visual interest? Okay, we can work in that step. Or do they attempt to engage in play with that, if you're modeling that, that's great. So then we can continue to move forward on those steps. But if they turn to look away, that shows too far. Um, and that's just kind of how you know if you're working at that correct stage or if you're jumping too far ahead. Um, so those can just be some signs to look into. Um, okay. Children 
learn the best through play. So we can always think of playful ways to encourage engagement. So some of my favorite ones to do are um, if kids really enjoy art or craft projects, you can make something out of food. You can do food art. So we've made um, like a house out of food or we will make trees or various other things. You can use a broccoli to paint with um, sometimes we'll use like Greek yogurt and we'll put either food coloring in there or um, we will also put Kool-Aid packages to kind of change the color and we can use some paint with that, but then it's also safe for them if they do want to taste it. Um, or if they enjoy facial expression, so you can build a face with food or sometimes we'll have some round things that we can use as eyes and some stick shaped things. So we'll put some of those things out and see, oh, we have eyes. Maybe we can build it together. That way we can get some visual. They can get tactically involved by touching and manipulating those to create that as well. I have a lot of friends that really love dinosaurs. So we'll make, we'll do lots of round shaped foods so they can be dinosaur eggs or they can be like a dinosaur tooth. So we can talk about how these things could look like this for a dinosaur and use that, that um, building block to kind of increase engagement with some other foods. So like we could use a meatball because that one's round and we could use um, a, a pistachio seed because it's, or a pistachio because it's round-ish um, and kind of work with that and talk about like, oh, it's a dinosaur egg or does it roll and kind of engage and play with those. Um, familiar play scheme. So thinking about how your kid plays, do they like bouncing things or rolling or smushing them? Um, we will frequently turn tomatoes into like launchers so we can squish them and the seeds will kind of go all over the place. So there's some fun ways to engage in some of that. Um, and it's so, so important to engage and play alongside your child and do that model so that they know that these options are safe for them to do with these foods. Um, Cause that's kind of how they learn about safety um, by learning through play. Um, and then we have when to refer. So if your child has a food range of less than 20 foods consistently, um, if they have strong preferences for textures or brands of foods, if you're finding that mealtimes are a fight, um, if your child has ongoing poor weight gain or they're starting to fall off of the growth curve because of their selective diet, that could be a piece as well. Um, kids that are doing food jagging, so they're eating the same foods repetitive, repetitively, and then they're kind of burning out on those foods and don't want them anymore. Um, that's why that variety can be important. Um, if you find yourself often making different meals for all of your family members, because some of them eat this and some of them eat that, um, that can be a sign as well. And if you're seeing choking or gagging on foods or messy or noisy eating as well. Um, and then these are just the remaining webinars that we have. So um, November 14th, we have Emerge Clubs with Laura. And November 21st, we have Reading Therapy with Laura as well. Um, and, and I did want to mention, sorry to interrupt. I did want to mention that for Emerge Clubs, we haven't announced our club lineup yet, but that is coming very soon. Um, and if you attend uh, the Emerge Clubs webinar and you end up signing up for one of the Emerge Clubs, you will actually save $50 just for coming to the webinar. Um, so it's a great opportunity to not only learn what we're offering um, in our clubs next year, um, but also to save a little bit of money. And then um, if anybody has any questions. No ask here or my contact information is right there. You can feel free to send me an email with any as well. Awesome. Um, sorry if you're hearing some noise, we are changing uh, appointments right now. So um, there is some, some fun happening very close to me. Um, Gwen, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Um, I always learn a lot when talking to you about feeding therapy. So I'm really grateful that we have offered this opportunity for other people to learn more. Um, the easiest way to kind of get started or ask some questions, I would say, is to email Gwen directly. Her email address is right there. Um, but if you are ready to jumpstart this process and move forward, you can go to our website and just fill out our initial inquiry form and we'll get in touch with you. Um, uh, it, it could be with Gwen and Carborough. I believe we offer 
services at our other locations, but we will work with what works best for you. Um, and yeah, I think, I think this is one of the ones that there's the, like opportunity to dispel some common misconceptions. Like I know I don't even have kids and I know that I've heard people talk about um, feeding, eating hurdles uh, in, in ways that um, there might be more to it. So I, I know I've heard a lot like, oh, they're just a picky eater or, um, you know, they'll adjust eventually or whatever the case might be. So I think this was a great opportunity to kind of dispel some of those common misconceptions. And we might not have even covered one that you have heard from people trying to support you through this. So um, if you have that like hunch, that gut feeling that this could be better or this could be more effective for you and your child, please get in touch with us because we would love to help. Um, and there is no uh, challenge to too great or too small that we are uh, equipped to take on. Our team is made up of incredible experts, just like Gwen. Um, so I don't think we have any questions, but people do know how to get in touch with Gwen directly. Like I said, if you're watching live now, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you are watching later, thank you for taking the time. Um, our contact information is evergreen. You didn't miss any contact info by not being here live. Please reach out to Gwen. Um, but we do want to reward someone here for being here. Uh, and so Erica, um, thank you for being here. You are going to receive, uh, a Jersey Mike's gift card from us. So I think that about covers it. Um, Gwen, thank you again for your time. Everyone, please come to Emerge Clubs next week and reading therapy after that. And also if you've missed any, um, they are all available on demand on our website and will eventually be turned into YouTube videos that you'll be able to access in an even easier way. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Um, we'll see you soon.